So I want to start by thanking the organizers very much, uh, like uh, previous speakers have, for putting together this great program, and I'm very happy to take part in it. Uh, Ali has set us up uh, very nicely towards a continued discussion of regulation issues. Uh, I'll be talking about mergers. Uh, we'll talk about how IO economists use data and theory together and apart uh, to some extent in order to evaluate uh, mergers. And I will also try to connect the discussion, and I will talk about models and techniques, etc. But I will also try to connect the discussion with the sort of policy debates that have been underlying this issue in the past uh, few decades. It's not always easy to do, because as Ariel has actually mentioned briefly on Tuesday, those debates are not really academic. Uh, they're often conducted by people who are not economists, and yet a lot of things that show up in our sort of models end up, you know, affecting somehow these debates. Some of the papers and research gets cited in those debates, so it's actually a worthwhile uh, exercise to think about that a little bit. Uh, and then when I started, doing, you know, working on these slides, I put product variety in parentheses, and then in the end I realized maybe there should be no parentheses. It will be sort of a, it will be a big parenthesis. Okay, I will spend some time on this. Uh, the big deal would be to think about models in which not only prices but also product selections are being endogenously determined and how lessons from these models can affect you know, how we think about mergers and even collusion and we'll tap, tap into some of the stuff that came up kind of endogenously during Ali's talk on all these things. Um, so, to begin. Uh, so the first part, which will take me probably the better part of today and some of the session tomorrow uh, would actually be 99% of the literature on mergers, which is mergers with fixed products. So here, the, com the comparison of what happens before and after the merger is all about what happens to price. Uh, the set of products that are offered are fixed, except two firms are allowed to merge. How does that affect prices? And so indeed, uh, you know, to some extent, we don't really need to talk about the Williamson model, given that we got a better <laughs> version, I think, in Ali's talk. But indeed, there is this basic trade-off that people have alluded to, which is that a merger can, on the one hand, restrict competition. It can shift marginal revenue curves, drive prices upward. But at the same time, there might be some efficiency gains that are driving cost curves downward. Uh, and so what ends up happening uh, is, um, uh, depends on that uh, trade-off. But I will talk about that paper not, uh, you know, not so much for the model itself, but actually for all the stuff that he writes after the model, which are like eight or nine different things that are not in the model, and he says, you know, we should pay attention to this, and that would motivate a lot of what's coming later, okay? Um, then we'll say, okay, imagine that you actually do want to evaluate this trade-off, uh, and indeed, this is uh, a big portion of what's been going on uh, in terms of empirical I.O. and merger evaluation. So here we talk about merger simulation. We think about estimating a structural model, of consumer preferences, of cost structures, and then we use that in counterfactual analysis to consider an imaginary world in which these two firms were allowed to merge, and we try to predict what were to happen. And so we can do that before a merger takes place to try to evaluate the likely uh, consequences. And the uh, empirical application that I will spend some time on is this very nice paper by Björnerstedt and Verboven. So they actually did something like that in real time for the Swedish Competition Authority. And they survived, and they came back to tell us, you know, what happened <laughs> in this very nice AJ applied paper. So we'll talk about that. Uh, and it would also, it, it's a nice paper because it shows both the power of these techniques and also some of the stuff that are really difficult to integrate into these techniques and where we might want to improve sort of moving forward. Uh, then we'll switch gears quite radically to talk about ex post analysis for mergers that actually took place. So this is retrospective analysis, so some mergers already happened, and now we want to go back to the data and ask what happened there, what happened to prices, what happened to welfare, etc. And uh, th this really is where, uh, you know, academic papers get cited a lot in this sort of current debate, which is, so I put in here uh, one quote, antitrust is dead, isn't it? This is actually attributed to uh, Supreme Court uh, Judge uh, Richard Posner, uh, who recently kind of suggested that maybe something went wrong <laughs> at, at some point and that it has become super difficult to oppose mergers and this feeds into this large debate of 
you know, concentration, mergers, uh, are firms too big, all that type of stuff. We will not get into that debate too seriously because it's difficult, <laughs> okay? That debate is not always about economics. But, uh, but that debate has generated a lot of demand for empirical papers that go back and ask, you know, all these mergers happened, what were the consequences of these mergers? And so we'll talk about some ways of analyzing the data with that purpose in mind, uh, uh, you know, such as natural experiments like, uh, like Hastings' AR paper, uh, some sort of a survey or meta-analysis as in this paper, uh, and, and, and also some other techniques. And we will try to see how we can use data in different ways in order to shed light on that uh, issue. Uh, then, okay, this is where uh, endogenous product selections uh, come into play. We'll talk about the mechanics of how to estimate and use models in which firms choose both products and prices. Uh, our starting point would actually be to note that uh, even before you have a merger or collusion or anything that shifts us towards a less competitive equilibrium, the market could fundamentally uh, get things wrong in terms of product selections in an oligopoly equilibrium. It could be that we get uh, uh, inefficient entry, excessive entry, duplication of fixed costs, or that we get the wrong type of products from a social planner's point of view. Uh, and then what will be interesting would be to think about, you know, what happens as we shift into a less competitive equilibrium. This taps really nicely into some of the <laughs> discussion we had uh, before the break. Uh, could it be that collusion all of a sudden can be you know, a good thing because maybe it can fix some of these problems? It's actually very easy to generate such examples. Uh, my point would not be to suggest that, you know, we should radically change, uh, you know, regulation of these issues and, uh, you know, say that collusion should not be per se illegal because maybe sometimes in some example it's good, but it might generate some thought about how maybe certain things should be allowed or considered or at least be in our mind as we evaluate uh, these two things. And uh, sort of on the empirical front, I'll talk about a couple of papers, one of them my own, uh, in which you actually try to sort of go into this issue, estimate the primitives, the cost and the demand structures that end up informing the question of, you know, do we get efficient allocations of products and prices before and after mergers under different types of market power and so on. All right. So let's start with uh, Williamson's paper, and actually it starts, uh, it starts with words, then there is a small model, and then there are more words, and the words are very interesting, and, and this is how he opens up, and he says, suppose that the merger yields economies, that is, you know, efficiency gains, but at the same time increases market power, can the courts and antitrust agencies safely rely on the literal reading of, of the law, which prohibits mergers uh, that's, that lessen competition or create monopoly, or does this run the risk of serious economic loss? Uh, then he says, in the occasional case where both efficiency and market power consequences exist, can the efficiency motive be dismissed on the grounds that the market power effects invariably dominate? And if not, then maybe we should actually take it seriously and make a serious effort to establish the allocative implications of efficiency and market power effects associated with the merger. So what is he responding to? He's responding to this basic trade-off, but he's also responding to the type of legal environment that existed at the time that that paper was written. And so it's, it, it is worthwhile talking a tiny bit on what was the regulatory treatment of mergers like back in the 1960s, uh, courtesy of this nice review in Ashen, Felter, Haskin, and Weinberg. And the answer is, it was pretty tough, okay? The regulation was pretty tough on a number of dimensions. So first of all, this uh, efficiency defense, okay, defending the merger on the ground that it will be efficient was not really allowed so much in court. So part of this was the sort of legal point that, you know, the Sherman Act says that it is illegal to restrict competition. It doesn't say in parentheses, yes, but if it's efficient, maybe it's okay. It says that it's illegal. So that was the sort of mindset that, uh, uh, you know, the court would often just not be willing to even discuss uh, the question of whether the merger is uh, efficient. And sometimes, uh, although this is a bit anecdotal, efficiencies were actually used to attack the merger. So in this Procter & Gamble uh, Clorox case, the claim by the government was that the merger would actually create a very efficient entity, which will be to the detriment of small players. So really tough to defend uh, uh, mergers, especially with this efficiency defense. 
So how could you have a merger if, if you couldn't raise it in efficiency defense? Okay, excellent uh, uh, point. Uh, so to uh, uh, repeat the question, so the question was, so how could you defend the merger? If there is a trade-off and one thing is bad and one thing is good, then you cannot talk about the thing that's good. And so what really was going on was that, so the government was not required to demonstrate that prices would increase or that welfare will be uh, impaired in any way, but, but they were required to show that concentration would increase within a well-defined market um, be beyond a certain threshold that was kind of low. And so I guess the way to deal with that argument will be to attack the market definition case and say, you're, you're getting this wrong. We're also competing with all these other guys. And so the market is not as concentrated as you think. So I think that that's probably part of the answer, although it is a, val a very valid uh, a point. Yes? So the, uh, it seems that the downside of the merger or the collusion is that these firms will increase the price. So why can't government or the regulator just fix the some price and then let the firms do whatever they want to do? Okay, so the question is, uh, you know, sh would it be admissible for the government to say, look, I allow you to merge, but I don't allow you to charge a price beyond a certain ceiling? Uh, and so on some occasion, firms even voluntarily suggested to commit to not raise prices so that, uh, you know, so, so uh, but the point is that, you know, we don't necessarily want to do things in this way. You know, markets are dynamic. We probably want competitive effects to determine prices. We might even think that, you know, by allowing that, we might just have a, have a focal point of this high price, whereas we might think that competition would drive prices downward. So uh, basically, the question of whether we can just allow the firms to merge based on a promise or a commitment not to raise prices, you know, I'm not sure that, uh, that it would uh, uh, be the most efficient uh, way. No, so, so, sorry, this so yes. it, it's a government, right? So government can enforce them that, you know, you Government can approve mergers uh, with some conditions. Ali mentioned that. But typically these conditions would be, okay, we allow you to merge, but you would not be allowed to have an exclusive deal with customers or things like that. Typically the condition is not, you know, you would not raise, raise prices because of, of, of these other considerations. Let me push a bit forward on this. Um, and, and so again, you, you only had to show, so it, was, it also came up, you know, what should be considered, consumer welfare or total welfare? And so at this point, it was really neither one. You only had to show that concentration would go up beyond a certain threshold that, that would mean that you actually look at the merger. And those thresholds ended up being uh, quite low. So in the merger guidelines for 1968, they basically say something like, in a market where the combined market share of the top four companies is 75%, a merger among firms with the combined market share of 4% would be ordinarily challenged. Okay, that's pretty tough. Uh, you think about very small companies that want to merge, but because the industry is already somewhat concentrated, you don't allow that. And one case where this type of stuff famously came up was this Vons grocery case. So here, this wasn't even that much of a concentrated industry at the time. The C10 was 50%. The top 10 firms had 50% of the market, but the government successfully challenged the merger of two supermarket chains with a combined market share of 7.5%. And the argument there was that, it's true the market is not concentrated yet, but there is this slippery slope here, okay? If we allow them to start doing these things, we might wake up tomorrow and see that there are only two firms. And these, these type of arguments worked back then. And I think that, you know, we'll talk about some of the uh, debates uh, today. I think that today some people say, well, you know, maybe this was not a bad idea. Maybe we should go back to these things. But clearly today, this is not how things are done. But this is the type of environment that Williamson was, uh, was trying to deal with. He was dealing with it with triangles and, and rectangles, which Ali has already covered, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, his point was that, look, there is this trade-off, and in fact, uh, even if consumer prices go up by 20%, uh, total welfare might actually uh, not be hurt as long as cost savings are, uh, are available by 4%. This is in terms of total welfare. Here consumers are getting hurt, but total welfare uh, would be fine. This is, of course, in a very stylized example, uh, you know, but he just wanted to make the point. What, what's somewhat more uh, important, especially given that we have talked about this basic trade-off, is all this stuff that he goes through later. He basically gives us a long list of things that are not in this model, 
and that we should be thinking about. And I'm not going to talk about all these things, but clearly partial equilibrium versus general equilibrium. Uh, there might be some resource allocation across sectors, uh, uh, considerations that are not here. Uh, very important, inference and enforcement expense. So in order to sort of really take this uh, to the bank, you would need to somehow evaluate both the deadweight loss generated by a, a lessened degree of competition and the efficiency gains. And, and that might be very costly, so he says we should only get into that if there is reasonable, uh, if, if it's reasonable to think that the gains might be serious, otherwise, you know, why go into this at all? But he said that the burden of proof should rest with the companies, and then he sort of anticipates some other stuff we'll talk about. He says that Bork apparently would be against this. And okay, we'll come back to, to why and, and who. Uh, another point that he makes is that you know, some of these efficiency gains may be realized anyways over time. As the market expands, there might be some economies of scale and some of these efficiency gains would be realized anyways. So when you do the counterfactual and ask how much efficiency gains do I obtain by the merger, you, you know, if you think about it as, as some sort of a discounted flow of future payoffs, what he says is that it could be that the cost savings decline over time because they would be realized anyway. So the part of them that can be attributed to the merger will become smaller, whereas the deadweight loss might persist. So this is another caveat for the notion that we can do this static analysis of uh, cost and benefit for mergers. Um, right, not going to talk about all of these things. Uh, but okay, again, you know, the efficiencies might be limited to the operations of these two merging firms, but prices might go up for all firms because of prices being uh, strategic complements. Uh, what if we care about income redistribution from consumers to producers? Uh, so presumably, if, even if total welfare is not hurt by the merger, still there might be some transfer from consumers to producers. Um, political issues with large firms becoming larger, he sees that as a serious concern, which is difficult to integrate into the economic analysis, and that's always been the case. Um, and, and finally, would product and process innovation be slowed down by a merger? All of these big, big questions that are not in this basic trade-off. We ask about those concerns. Um, so if, uh, if I am firm and I want to merge and I'm, I'm telling the judge, look, so my profits are going to increase, consumers are going to pay more, but I am wholly owned by the consumers. So they are going to get the benefit from my dividends. Is this an argument that's being made or is Make sense? I'm, I'm not aware of it being made. There are some other folks here that might have encountered it, but I've, I, I, I haven't encountered that, that debate, uh, that, that type of argument. Uh, Just to add yeah. to his point, but not all consumers hold the shares of that firm, right? Say some very limited people hold, or maybe. So, yeah. so the loss may be to every consumer, but gain will just be yeah. No, I agree. So, so the questions are about, you know, what happens if consumers actually own the companies, etc. I think that, you know, we, you know, I'm not going to have a lot to say on this. Ultimately, as things have evolved, indeed, the regulation focused on looking at consumer surplus as the object of interest. And ultimately, part of the revolution that happened after Williamson wrote uh, these things, and, and especially after Bork wrote his book, was that uh, now the government had to prove that consumers would be hurt, that prices would go up. Whereas beforehand, that was not uh, uh, required as much. Uh, and so indeed, we mentioned uh, Robert Bork, who wrote this very influential book, and, and, and also, uh, uh, you know, other, uh, other uh, uh, writings on, on the matter. And he took a very, very um, sort of strict approach towards the whole thing. He said that the merger enforcement should change radically, so that it is way too tough. He actually argued that most mergers are totally benign, that they are good. Um, he suggested that only mergers to monopoly or such that create a dominant firm are actually a cause for concern. Uh, he was also not a big fan of oligopoly theory. He says something like, you know, if you have a merger that moves us from triopoly to duopoly, then you care about this maybe if you believe in this oligopoly theory and market power within oligopoly. And he says, I'm, I'm not sure that this exists outside of economics textbooks. Okay. Uh, he, had, he had a very, a very strong position, but I think it was a bargaining position. He wanted to shift the debate, and so he was, he was willing to make some bold statements. Um, he also suggested that merger analysis should indeed focus on economic uh, 
analysis. Uh, and so that, you know, just showing that concentration goes up should not, you know, maybe it's a necessary condition for opposing a merger, but not a sufficient one. You need to show that something bad would actually happen. Yep. Yes, it was. I'll talk about that on the next slide. Okay? So I'll come back to that. Uh, then he had this interesting, you, know, you, you would think in light of all this that he would be in favor of the idea of Williamson, which is that we should measure the cost and the benefit and, and actually figure out uh, what to do. He was actually very skeptical that we can do that, sort of along the lines of Farrell and Shapiro, you know, can we actually do merger simulation? So, <laughs> you know, I think he wrote this stuff in the late 60s. Uh, you know, computers were not sort of running simulations back then, so, you know, it might not be surprising that he didn't think that this will work uh, so much. And so he says, you know, if you want to really do this evaluation of the, of the benefits and costs, it would require estimating the demand curve over all possibly relevant ranges, etc., and the marginal cost curve. And then he, uh, he talks about counterfactuals. He says the trial would then proceed to the measurement of efficiency and restriction of output. Under an imaginary set of circumstances, what would the net contribution be if the two firms were merged? So he's basically taking demand estimation and merger simulation and saying this is science fiction, you know, <laughs> we're not going to do this, <laughs> right? Well, I, I mean, it's a very valid point to make when he's making it, right? Yeah? But if he's rejecting economic theory and he's rejecting economic empirics, what's, what's <laughs> left of economic analysis? <laughs> <laughs> That book is fascinating, I think, because of that reason. I, uh, you know, I like the treatment of, you know, Ashenfelter et al. They sort of, you know, they, they make some critical review of that, of that book. I, I agree. But the point was to shift the debate. It's not so much of an academic book, but it is very influential. And then, and then he has this other point, which I also think is really nice. Uh, economists, like other people, okay, will measure what is susceptible to measurement and will tend to forget what is not. Though what is forgotten may be far more important than what is measured, that is a very valid point. For him, this is about the efficiencies. He says, you know, what's going to happen is that we're going to show up, and it will be easy to measure the, the detriment to consumers or the dead weight loss, but the efficiencies, people would say, oh, you know, this is, these are fairy tales. I cannot measure it, therefore it does not exist. And that's actually, that, that has been a sort of a lingering problem for merger evaluation. I think Ali mentioned that uh, a couple of times. That is true. Okay. Right. What happened next? Okay, I promise you we are moving into economics real, real fast. Uh, but but this, this is interesting stuff. So this debate, you know, for all its parts, actually has considerably shifted the regulatory landscape uh, so that now things are, are very different than they were, than the type of stuff that these guys were commenting on. So first of all, it is no longer sufficient to show that concentration would increase within a well-defined market. Uh, you now also need to show that price would increase, that consumer welfare would be hurt, or that there will be any sort of, you need to establish a theory of harm. Okay, you cannot just say concentration would go up and that's bad. Um, right, going back to your point, regulators now have to show or at least discuss the possibility that the merger effect will be neutralized by additional entry. So this is like a contestable market type of, of an idea, you know, if firms would merge, but then that would just open up the market and some other firms would enter, then maybe we shouldn't worry about this and maybe it's actually efficient, maybe we would realize some efficiency gains in entry. And so now, now, you are, now you actually have to think about that or at least um, in some cases. And an efficiency defense is now possible and as Williamson wanted, the burden of proof lies with the merging parties. So these are the, there are also other changes like now if you want to merge, you have to submit a request and the authorities need to give you an answer fairly quickly. Uh, beforehand, you would merge, and then you could be sued, and then maybe five years later, you would be told that you need to divest. So a lot of things moved in a sort of a, you know, in a very clear direction. All right, so now we move into major simulation. So now we are jumping ahead quite a bit into some, you know, theory econometric techniques that are sort of there in order to try to make this operational. So how can we actually evaluate the economic consequences of the merger? Would prices go up? What happens to consumers and so on? Um, and so these are indeed the tools that have developed and, you know, Ariel talked about them on Tuesday. Um, you know, demand estimation, structural estimation of cost and demand systems, and then the application of those estimated uh, uh, models within a counterfactual 
analysis that asks how does the price equilibrium change given the estimated consumer preferences. Once I estimated the model, it's as if I have downloaded the operating system of consumers. I now know how consumers would respond to different changes, to different uh, uh, pricing schemes, and then I can sort of go back and ask how would firms likely respond uh, uh, to the ability to, to price uh, jointly following the merger, anticipating how consumers would respond. And with that structure, you can come up with some prediction of what the merger effect will be. All right, um, so before we get into the analytics of this, uh, let's, let's also be very clear on what merger simulation actually does. Merger simulation literally asks if the world stays exactly as it is right now, and the only thing that changes is that these two firms are allowed to operate as one, uh, what's going to happen? Whereas, uh, there is a second question which might be a little bit more relevant to, to, to the decision that needs to be made at the competition authority, which is that what will happen to prices considering the impact of the merger plus any other things that might be happening at the same time. So for example, you know, the world doesn't stay constant while this merger takes place. It could be that there are some good claims that demand will go up or down, or that there will be some reforms that facilitate entry. And so as you really think about how bad or good this merger will be, you might need to consider all these other things. And it's really hard to add all these other things as well into the merger simulation, although some limited heuristics regarding cost efficiencies, changes in conduct can be fed into the simulation. I think this uh, Bjornerstedt and Verboven paper will give us an opportunity to talk about some of these ways to sort of push the envelope on that. But fundamentally, how does this work? So we start by estimating a differentiated product demand system, which often is the random coefficient logit, from uh, Barry Levinson Pecus, uh, but some, sometimes also nested logit, which, uh, which just estimates faster, uh, while still capturing a lot of the uh, uh, you know, economic content. Uh, sometimes that choice is made maybe because of time. If you want a quick answer, maybe you want a simpler model, but that's not really what I want to uh, talk about. This is really key because once I estimated consumer preferences, now I know uh, basically just how substitutable the two goods are that are merging. If these are very close substitutes, then we are really uh, uh, considering here the merger of two firms that are strong competitors, and then probably the main effect of the merger will be to lessen competition. Whereas, if the cross-elasticity of demand between these two products is very low, then probably the concern associated with the merger is almost non-existent, and then probably the only reason why they might even want to merge is that there might be some efficiency gain. So estimating elasticities, and in particular cross-elasticities of demand, really is the sort of most intuitive part of this. Uh, and then what do we do? So step two, having estimated the demand system, is that we back out the marginal cost right now, sort of prior to the merger. So let, let, let me be clear about sort of what's happening here. So this is the timeline, and we are here. Uh, so this is the point where the firms might merge, but we are here. They still didn't merge, and we are trying to figure out if it's a good idea or not. And the second step is about figuring out what marginal cost is right now. And so how can we do that? So we've actually seen a little bit of that actually in Mike's uh, uh, talk, where he got into the Villas Boas uh, first order conditions. So you actually begin by solving the problem uh, for the multi-product uh, oligopolist. So this is the profit maximization problem uh, for, a, for a given firm. You basically sum over the products that you sell. This is a multi-product firm. And uh, these, are the mar these are the markups. You assume constant marginal cost here for simplicity. This is how much you earn per unit sold of product J, one of your products multiplied by quantity, this is revenue, or, well, variable profits because we already accounted for the variable costs, and then you uh, deduct the, the fixed cost. So this is what you're trying to maximize. Uh, in a Nash Bertrand competition, this is basically what, what is happening. Each of us, each of the firms will be solving this problem independently, sort of taking as given the prices of the other firms. As you write down the first order conditions, and you stack them together, you obtain this system. You obtain basically a vector of markups, the difference between prices 
prior to the merger. All this we do with the situation that is currently taking place. So this is the difference between price and marginal cost. This is a vector for all products in the market before the merger. And it is equal to this expression. So what's going on here? This is a vector of market shares prior to the merger. This is observed in the data. Um, this is a matrix of demand derivatives. So the elements of this matrix are given here. The sort of uh, row J, R column element is the derivative of the market share of the product with respect to price. This is, the, this is the element that you get from the demand estimation. This is why you needed to estimate demand because once I estimated preferences, now I know how a marginal change in price of one product would affect the market share of that product or any other product. So I needed the, the demand estimation purely to sort of feed it into this matrix here. This matrix here is an ownership matrix and it is uh, a block diagonal one. So imagine that firm one has products one, two, and three, and that firm two has products four and five. So this matrix basically will tell you which products belong to whom. So in this situation, if these are the first five products, then the pre-merger ownership matrix would look like this. This is simply a way of stacking together first order conditions and clarifying that as I'm solving my own profit maximization problem, I need to sum over the products that I control. And I need to account for basically, uh, you know, cross effects between my products as I set my uh, prices. So this is a bit technical, but this is what's going on. Okay, this is just a representation of, of the first order conditions. That allows me to back up the marginal cost. Okay, that's what happens. Now I go to step three, okay, this is the sort of punchline. Now I solve for the sort of post-merger prices that are predicted in the new oligopoly equilibrium. So what will be the new vector of prices that satisfies these first order conditions following the merger? So how do we do that? We basically come back to this matrix and we say now we no longer have one firm that controls three products and another one that controls the next two products, but we actually have one firm following the merger that controls all of them. So that is the fundamental change. You basically just change this matrix. This is now the omega star post. And you plug in the marginal cost that you have already obtained. And you look for a fixed point. You look for a set of prices that, a vector of prices that solves the first order conditions following the merger. When Ali was discussing suggested that uh, there were these synergies which were above and beyond reallocating uh, production from, uh, from one firm to the other. How, this doesn't seem to capture any, uh, any of those synergies. Absolutely. So the question is about you know, how are synergies captured here? And so far, they were not. And so on the, on the next slide, you know, there are some comments. Uh, and in particular, what you can do, this is the weakest part of this, if you think that marginal cost would be lower by a factor of 10%, you can just basically come back here and plug in sort of 0.9 times the original marginal cost. So this reflects, you know, the weakest part of this, which is how to predict what will happen to costs, which is what Bork was worried about, that, you know, it will be very difficult to convince that this should go down significantly because some of these synergies, especially those that go above and beyond reallocation, might be very difficult to be, um, to be argued in court. But, but this is one way in which you can enrich this. So, you know, indeed, one limitation is that you need to think about what happens to marginal cost. Another limitation is that we had to commit to some particular competitive conduct, in this case, Nash Bertrand. That's how we solve this problem. We assume that we each maximize our prices, conditional on other folks' prices. This is Nash Bertrand competition, but it could be that to begin with, we were nicer to each other. Okay, maybe we were closer to a collusive regime. That would definitely change things, but uh, you know, so first you have to take a stand on this, and this has always been a big deal. And then also there is the question of maybe that conduct itself changes following the merger. So Ali mentioned that, and John will talk about that. Okay, about some papers that try to look for whether 
we actually do become nicer to one another after the merger. And what would be a way to capture these things? So this is another can of worms, but imagine that to begin with, you don't think that these are zeros, but you actually plug in some conduct parameter tau that says that, yes, I care about my products, but I also care about your products a little bit. Okay, if tau is one, then I fully care about them. We are really trying to do things together uh, in perfect collusion, but I could care about you to some extent. The problems with conduct parameters are, are very familiar. It's very difficult to estimate them or to sort of, re well, to estimate them is very simple. To believe that you actually identified them is much more difficult, okay? So this is another set of problems. Um, some other comments. If you really want, I don't see, uh, you know, I mean, if the choice is between this and having a beer and watching soccer, I'm not sure. But if you really want, I can actually assign a problem set that I have involving MATLAB <laughs> implementation of this. So there is uh, this, fake this fake data set in there, and you can estimate the demand for shoes, fake shoes. And then <laughs> you get to program the merger simulation. It's very, it's very simple. It's like demand is logit. Um, etc. You know, talk to me if you're interested. Right? This or beer? Sorry? <laughs> why is it this or beer? Actually, beer and MATLAB are compliments. I even had a, <laughs> I had a Facebook post on this once, when, when I was still on Facebook. <laughs> All right. Talked about this, talked about that. Uh, I didn't talk about this. This is, this I think is sort of like a big theoretical point which is that the existence and uniqueness of this price equilibrium is actually not, is actually a matter of, uh, of, uh, of serious uh, concern from the theoretical standpoint. So this literature starts with um, Kaplan and Neighbor who established that if you have logit demand and single product firms, then you are actually guaranteed the existence of a unique pure strategy equilibrium in prices. But most often we don't want logit demand, we want systems that allow for more reasonable substitutes substitution patterns, and also we have these multi-product firms, that's also a problem. Uh, but then there is this recent paper uh, uh, that really pushed the envelope on these uh, things. So the version that I saw definitely uh, incorporated multi-product firms and showed that it's still fine, but I think that the most updated version also allows for things like uh, nested logit and even random coefficient, but I have to check because it, it keeps getting updated. Practically though, uh, I think that it is well accepted that, you know, maybe theoretically it's hard to prove that this is unique and that it exists, but in practice it solves real quick and you always get the same answer no matter where you start. You basically start with some guess and you look for the price equilibrium and it works out really nicely. And in some projects that I had, I had to solve this like millions of times and, and you know, it just... It seems to work, <laughs> okay? And I think that we are getting closer to the point of actually proving that it should work. All right, so a tiny bit of build up uh, towards this Bjornerstedt and Verboven uh, uh, paper. So, uh, so what is this nested logit model all, uh, this nested logit model all about? Again, I think that today we are, you know, even estimating a random coefficient logit is not so much of a big deal any anymore. We have fast computers and you know a lot of people also in the competition authorities know how to do this and have estimated these things but still in some of these uh, situations you can work with a simpler model that really tries to capture market segmentation in a very intuitive fashion so the idea of the nested logit which of course goes back already to McFadden in the, in the 70s is that you have a discrete choice problem consumer I needs to choose among a set of differentiated options J and the point is that we can begin, to begin with, from the point of the research, uh, we can sort of classify products into these nests. So this is our stand. This is the stand that we take on the segmentation of this market. This is the automobile market. We might conjecture that there is a, a compact segment where you would have the Toyota Yaris and Honda Jazz, and that there will be a sedan segment with Mazda 3 and all these other types of cars. In practice, what this nesting means is that you allow the consumer unobserved taste shifters to be correlated within, but not across these nests. This is the, the, the big thing. So here you have the utility function that defines the utility of consumer I from product J. It depends on some factors that affect everybody. Uh, you know, Ariel talked about these models a tiny bit, and I don't want to get into demand estimation here. 
but utility depends on product characteristics, on price, also on some characteristic that we don't observe, right? But that affects everybody. And then there is this idiosyncratic term. And the manner with which this term is correlated or not correlated across products really matters. If it is allowed to be correlated within this segment, that would help us generate reasonable substitution patterns. Because then if I'm a person who actually bought a Honda Jazz, uh, imagine that that product becomes expensive or is removed from the market, I would now be very likely to switch to a similar automobile. Why? Because to begin with, most likely I obtained a positive shock, strong positive shock for both of them, if they are allowed to be correlated. Now, you might also say, okay, but then you already, basically, you are done before you started because you sort of assumed <laughs> what the market segmentation looks like, which is going to be the key question for the merger analysis. But the point, this will, this will come up nicely in this Beyond the and Verboven paper, which is that I think that the correct way to think about this is that this is our hypothesis, and then we allow the data to either validate it or reject it. Okay, because the data would need to return this parameter sigma, which determines the extent of this correlation. The data can reject this uh, nesting structure that I imposed on it by, say, uh, sending this uh, correlation to be above one or below zero or just very close to zero. Or maybe I get a valid sigma, but I compute elasticities and things seem completely crazy. So the data has all sorts of ways to inform me about whether this was reasonable. And I can also, you know, play with this. I can consider different structures and see which ones hold better under the data uh, situation. But it's not a magic box. You need to start with some qualitative assessment of the substitution patterns, and then you sort of test it and, try and you try to quantify it using the data. All right, this goes to, to the estimation, I think, uh, somewhat less uh, crucial at this point. Can I say one thing? Sure. Uh, you know, the, the low digit is fine, except for the alpha. Because you, you're interested in the price parameter, and people with different incomes have different elasticity with respect to price. And so if you do this in different markets, with, you know, one is a poor city and one is a rich city, you're going to screw up royal. That's if you just added an alpha i there and integrated it out. Yes. I absolutely agree. And actually, it is also my preference often, you know, if I do want to economize and I don't want to do like a very elaborate random coefficient with many random coefficients, then if you just want to have one, you should have it here. I, I absolutely agree. That generates, yes, completely agree. All right. So what happened in Sweden? So the background is that in 2009, uh, there was a proposed merger uh, in the Swedish uh, painkillers market between the uh, Swedish subsidiary of AstraZeneca, which is a very famous pharmaceutical, of course, and the GlaxoSmithKline. Klein. And these companies re requested permission to perform this merger. And um, the question was, you know, what's going to happen? Is this a good merger or a bad one when we are here? Okay, we still don't know. This is the first part of the paper. We still don't know. It's like, you know, it's a very, it's a very interesting paper. In the beginning, you don't know what's going to happen. The big issue is about the nature of segmentation. This goes back to this nested logit type thought experiment. Because one way to uh, consider segmentation of this market is to look at the active substance. Basically, you can have painkillers that are based on paracetamol, on ibuprofen, these are the Advils, uh, or aspirin. And the question is, to what extent are consumer tastes correlated within these segments? To what extent are some consumers very loyal to paracetamol and would only substitute among paracetamol-based painkillers? Um, it turns out that this will be the crucial point because these two companies were the only ones actually selling paracetamol-based uh, painkillers. So if this is a well-defined market segment, then what we would have here is a merger from duopoly to monopoly so even Rob Robert Bork would say, oh, wait a minute, right? So, <laughs> okay. But the question is, is that the correct segmentation for the market? Okay, it could be. And actually, it did come up in the sort of qualitative assessment of this market by the Swedish authority that there could be other ways of thinking about segmentation. And some people have argued that it's not about the active substance. It's actually about the brand, that people are loyal to the brand, but not necessarily to the active substance. If that is literally true, 
then the merger causes no concern. It's fine. I, I have some people who are very loyal to the paracetamol-based painkiller of one of these companies, and some folks who are very loyal to the other thing, so they already have monopoly over these folks. A merger would not allow them to raise prices any further. And so it becomes an empirical question to some extent. And the way that this is typically handled or traditionally handled is not really so much with econometrics, but rather with a qualitative assessment. You talk to people, you run some surveys, etc. And, uh, you know, quite often this is what, uh, what you did, especially before these techniques have developed. But also today, probably quite often this is what you would do because you don't always have the time, the resources, or otherwise to do, what, uh, to do the merger simulation. However, in this particular case, the Swedish authority did commission a merger simulation study by these authors, and that's what they are going to show us. They're going to show us what they actually predicted. There were also some mitigating factors. I mentioned that there are things that are difficult to incorporate into the merger simulation. For example, okay, th this is a great example. There was also a, a, an expected reform in 2009 of the Swedish pharmacies. The pharmacies were basically a government monopoly, and uh, this reform was meant uh, to turn, uh, to basically privatize this, to introduce competition into the pharmacy segment. So you think about, you know, this, this, this goes back to vertical stuff. We have the pharmaceuticals upstream selling drugs, and then you have the, the pharmacies that are actually selling the drugs to consumers. And the idea was that the downstream market will become more competitive, and some of the claims that were made in favor of the merger was that once the downstream market becomes more competitive, it would actually induce additional drug entry. That these guys would start sourcing from additional uh, pharmaceutical companies and then maybe the concern will go away. Right now we only have these two companies selling paracetamol-based painkillers, but maybe after this reform, additional companies would enter the Swedish market. Again, this is something that, you know, you think about this and we think about everything that we have seen about vertical markets in the first couple of days of the school and you see how many sort of non-trivial steps you have to follow here to get to this conclusion. And it's not immediately clear that a more competitive downstream market would induce additional entry of upstream products. You know, you have to really think very carefully about that. But that was uh, the leading theory, at least at the time. Yes. I'm trying to consider the, the sanity of the claim uh, that uh, it's all about the brand. So say uh, the two paracetamol companies uh, get married and they raise one of the brand's price by 2,000%. So I come to the pharmacy and I usually buy this brand and, and they tell me, okay, so you need to pay now $2 million. So I say, okay, I'm not going to pay that. And so what, what should I take? And the claim is that the pharmacist is as likely to tell me aspirin than the other paracetamol. That's, that's what you need to... Well, if you take that claim to an extreme, if it's a zero-one thing, then yes, that will be the interpretation. Of course, it's not a zero-one thing. In reality, what you would like to have, sort of ideally, is a random coefficient logic model, where you have a random coefficient on the active substance and an active coefficient on the brand, and then you allow people to be somewhat loyal to the active substance and somewhat loyal to the brand, and you can allow both of these things to be in there, and then you can quantify which one is more important, right? And I don't think anybody there has sort of suggested that only brand matters. Sure, surely for some people, the active substance will be the most important thing. If you are sensitive to ibuprofen, for instance, then you're not going to switch uh, to that. If you're not allowed to take aspirin because of other conditions, you're not going to switch to aspirin, or you can only take aspirin. So definitely for some consumers, this will be a... Yeah, but I'm saying right? that even, even if you are very mildly concerned about the active substance, then it should mean that if you have, you, you're going to have a monopoly on this substance. So everybody is going to switch to the, to the if only the price of one of them changes, everybody is going to switch to the, to the other paracetamol. Am I getting this wrong? Uh, yeah, because it's a matter of, of degree, okay? Not everyone, first of all, in these models, if everybody has some random shocks for all products. So some people are just going to sort of randomly switch. Uh, and then the other thing is that, yes, okay, segmentation could run across several uh, uh, dimensions, and it's really a matter of degree. So ultimately, this is about the cross-price elasticities. 
If they are very strong within the active substance, then the merger is bad. If they are, if they are weak, but, but not, you know, not zero, but, but weak, then maybe the merger is not going to generate much harm. And so first you estimate the model, you kind of get a sort of an intuitive view of how substitutable drugs are within and outside active substance. And then you do the merger simulation and you come up with a number. So, okay, by how much prices are likely to increase, but it will be the relationship between the model estimate and that number will be quite, will be quite clear. <coughs> All right, so what do they do? I'm not going, f you know, I'm kind of, you know, skipping a lot of the details. But step one is to estimate the demand system, just like we mentioned, okay? We do that, and they actually, I think they added the random coefficient logit to the final version of the paper, but at least in the working paper version, it was a nested logit. It was actually a two-level nest model, where the first level was about the type of tablet. Is it fizzy tablet that you put in the water and it's, pssst, right? Or or the regular one, and then the sort of second uh, level of, of nesting is about the active substance. And again, okay, we talked about, you know, are we already imposing the answer when we get going with this? I, I argue that if you're careful, then, 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 then no, okay? Anyway, so this sigma is the relevant parameter for the, for the, for the relevant level of the nest of the active substance it was estimated to be fairly high, 0.86. Remember, this parameter moves around between 0 and 1. If it's close to 0, segmentation by active substance is almost irrelevant or irrelevant. Okay, so to get back to your point, uh, you know, if sigma is 0.03, then yes, I mean, there is some segmentation by active substance, but it's probably not very important. You get fairly high here. So basically, the data comes back to you and says, yes, you know, there is segmentation by active substance. This, that's what you get from, uh, from the data. Then you run the simulation. Okay, you back up the marginal cost and uh, from, uh, you know, in the sort of pre-merger world, and then you create a counterfactual. You feed up, you, you, you know, you, you replace zeros or taus with ones, and you compute the new equilibrium prices. And the prediction from this was that prices would rise substantially. It was something between 35% and 50%. Okay, the prediction was, was, was fairly stark. Are there instruments here? It's like a lot of this turns on how credible the instruments are. Yeah, so, so here they used, uh, there wasn't much sort of, um, there were no surprises here in terms of instruments, but uh, the instruments were characteristics and characteristics of rivals within NIST, the type of, uh, the type of instruments that are familiar from the BLP framework. Um, and I agree, ultimately it's all about the availability of, uh, of good instruments, you know, so we have by now a lot of, uh, uh, you know, work on the non-parametric identification of these models, uh, and we know that it's all about having sort of valid instruments, so definitely that's, that's in there. All right, so basically uh, the prediction is that prices would go up like crazy, but it, it, it depends, because when they fit in, uh, when they fit in a prediction that marginal cost would actually be reduced by, say, 25%, which is a very radical view of the likely synergies, then that price increase is almost negated entirely. And the paper doesn't include, in, in, you know, very detailed uh, information on all these considerations, but ultimately... Sorry. So if the efficiencies were as high as 25%, 25%, yes, which is very, very high. Can I yes. Sorry? Is Ad advertising considered a marginal cost? No. So obviously, yes. So, you know, I guess it, exactly the type of discussion that you need to have. Okay, now, okay, somebody dis did this research for you and they tell you, if everything stays the same, and, this, and the only thing that happens is that the zeros become ones, prices go up by 40%, but now we need to start asking, okay, what about synergies? Where can we find them? Are those fixed costs related or marginal costs related? Are there substantial synergies to, accept, to expect in the marginal cost of production of pharmaceuticals versus maybe in the detailing costs and the sort of marketing of these uh, drugs to physicians, etc.? You need to get into all these things. <coughs> 
ultimately the merger was approved um, and it was approved on account of basically saying that, okay, first of all, they expected this reform to be very important. They said, okay, this holds the world fixed, but the world is going to change. Uh, they also said, okay, we have a simulation, but also the simulation suggests that prices may not go up by much if there are synergies. Bottom line, the merger was approved, right? And then, and it, it's actually nice that the merger was approved. Yeah, sorry? So did they do it? Uh, can I just ask a few questions? Sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, so you just said it, you know, tw if we don't have this additional entry, it takes 25% synergies, which is massively bigger than anything that would probably happen. But uh, the entry, like, you could have used this model to say how much entry would you need to have in order to... Yes. Prevent a price increase with, say, a 5% synergy? Like, is, what, did they do that? Okay, so they didn't do that, but the question is, you know, could we actually, you know, this potential entry that might happen because of the reform, could we actually feed it into the simulation exercise? They don't do it, but in principle you could, because the nice thing about these estimated models is that now I could actually introduce counterfactual products that are not there yet, right. so and they don't do that. They don't do that. said the random coefficients thing they added later. Did, I think. Do they talk about what they did during the investigation and how long they had? Not so much. Um, so my, so you know, I spent a lot of time reading the working paper version that was there and it kind of changed uh, along the way, but there were very few details on how long it took and, and all that stuff. And okay. there was no actual, and this was uh, the regulatory authority, uh, the, the equivalent of the DOJ then Yes. Okay. Yes. It, it didn't actually go to trial or anything. It didn't go to trial because Maybe it wouldn't have been a trial. Maybe I don't even know how their process works. Okay. Right. Uh, but yeah, given that it was approved, there was no trial. It was approved. It happened. Um, yes. But it, yeah, we don't know too much about sort of how it happened within the, at least not from the version of the paper that I read. Sorry. And, and what happened to the prices? Oh, fantastic! So that's the next slide. So I'm building up. I mean, I I'm building up. I'm building up. All right, it's, yes, it's uh, suspense. And so this is what happened, okay? Now I'm not, you know, you know, it's hard to read causal inference off of a picture, but in this case, maybe, maybe you can, okay? This is the paracetamol, this is the paracetamol-based price. This is when the merger happens, okay? It kind of looks like, <laughs> like something happens here. In fact, prices did shoot up like 40% or, so, or so, something like that. A miracle, okay? Um, actually, this, I, I thought about this picture also on Tuesday because Ariel talked a little bit about sort of, you know, we are very good at predicting sort of, you know, how one uh, Nash equilibrium would look like and then what type of new Nash equilibrium we would jump to, but we don't know a whole lot about how long it will take to get there. This is one example <laughs> where, you know, <laughs> it didn't take long. Sorry? No. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what actually happened uh, in, in terms of that reform. All right, so, uh, okay, what do we make of all this? So the title of the paper is, Does Merger Simulation Work? And it seems like the answer is yes, right? But I think that the message is much more general than that. I think that the real interpretation of these merger simulation techniques is that this is one input, one input that you can possibly use in making these informed decisions about mergers. It is perfectly legitimate to say, this is what the simulation shows, but I think it will not happen because I have some extra information that's not in your model. I think that demand would actually be shrinking. And so if I don't actually approve the merger, maybe some of these firms would just exit. There are all sorts of things that you can consider, all sorts of theories. And at the end of the day, the decision to approve a merger or not is not a scientific one and it could never be, okay? So I think that this tool is useful as a component, you sort of ask what would happen if, if the only thing that happens is that the zeros become ones. And that's part of what you want to know. And, and that should be based on a very ro robust estimation of the demand system. So you asked about instruments, of course. If I don't have very good instruments, then maybe I don't want to rely on this too much in this analysis. And so to what extent do you use this? Often, as Ariel mentioned, you know, you might do this, but it doesn't really uh, end up 
appearing at the, at, at the court phase. You do this, I think, to supplement other types of analysis that you do, qualitative analysis. You talk to people, you talk to analysts, etc. Maybe you also estimate a model, then you take in all that information and you make your best judgment and that's the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Eventually the merger is approved, and then very quickly something shoots up. Uh, so they either did an argue in good faith, or you know, but can you then go back and say, well, we, uh, we approved the merger based on some facts that clearly were far from reality, we are reversing the decision. Okay, so the question is, you know, imagine that something like this happens, can we then go back to court and say, oops, we made a mistake, we would like you to divest or break up. Right. Maybe it's optimal. They prove this is optimal. Yeah. All right. So, so. Optimal. Up to 40% only can sue us. So the short answer is that I'm not aware of any case where that where that happens, sort of in the in an actual legal system. Maybe some people here know. Sorry, where, where, where actually exposed, you go back. The competition authority goes back to the court and says, "Oops, we made a mistake. We want them to to break up." I'm not aware of such cases. Um, sorry. I mean, there are cases where after the fact, including some recently, they gone and sued, but I don't know whether they had internally like approved it. There's nothing that stops them from doing it, unlike you, know, it, you could approve and then after the fact go after it. So I guess it's a new situation. In the U.S. So the reason the merger guidelines were written were so that people would know, you know, so that you, you would know sort of the rules of the game and there wouldn't be so many problems after. Right. Yeah, and, and so, I mean, yeah. no, and that's, that's why we have pre-notification and all of that. That's the reason for all the institutions. Right. There's another. Yeah, there is another thing that is picking up here in this country, which is where uh, there is private litigation. Where basically, you know, something happens, not necessarily following a merger, but there is a very steep price increase, and then you sue and you say this is an abuse of dominant position and you, you, you sue for damages. But that's, that's, that, that's very different yeah, than what you asked about. Also maybe, uh, with price control, they think they became monopoly, right? Right. Yeah, but again, the issue of price control, I think, is a very sort of, this yeah, is like the last thing that you go to after everything fails and probably you don't. Reverse the merger with the very the radical thing yeah. to do, absolutely. You know, did they get the, the red prediction for the red and green lines? All right, so part of what the paper is about, the paper actually shows what, what the simulation missed, and part of this is about in exactly the response of the other segments. Some of these things were quite different in the simulation versus other stuff, and they try to get into the question of, uh, you, know, why, uh, you know, why rivals actually also increase price more or less than the simulation predicted, and why the logic structure might be better or less suited to capture some of these things. Uh, yeah, so there is some of that go going on too. It's not, it, it, it's not like this picture was sort of, you know, completely predicted by the, by the, by the, by the simulation in, in, in any way. Um, all right, so moving forward and sort of the final topic for today, which probably, you know, probably f wrap this up t tomorrow and then move to, uh, to, the, um, to the product variety stuff. So now let's uh, switch gears entirely, and now let's assume that the merger already happened. Now we are here, and we observe what happened, but typically it's not the picture is not as nice, right? Uh, typically you can't just look at it in this way and say, before the price was this, after the price is that, that was the effect of the merger. But you might still want to do a retrospective merger analysis. You might want to do this analysis. Why? First of all, intellectual curiosity, okay? We might be curious to know after all this debate what actually happens when firms merge. How does this trade-off play out, okay? Uh, but it also, you know, these type of papers also come up quite a bit in recent policy debates. 
So we hear a lot of claims these days that antitrust enforcement has become too lax. And so we mentioned that in the 60s, maybe the pendulum was, well, was here, it was very strict. Some people say now it's here. Okay, now it's become actually very difficult for the government to block mergers. Some very serious people say that. Uh, but also just, you know, but, you know, the economics behind this is not, uh, is not entirely, uh, is not entirely uh, uh, clear. It is a claim, but it is not a scientific uh, uh, claim. But people use published papers in order to try to either defend this position or oppose this position. There are also equally serious people who do not think that this is true. Who actually think that what we see is larger firms becoming larger because of actual efficiency. Amazon, Google, this is like, you know, this brings, there are huge uh, welfare contributions from these firms becoming larger. And so very serious people on both sides of the debate, also some less serious claims on both sides of the, of the debate, as often would be the case with blogs and politicians talking about things. But the question is, what does research have to say retrospectively about the mergers that have been approved? And, you know, is it true, for example, that only mergers to monopoly matter, as Bork has claimed? Okay. Or is it, uh, is it the case that many mergers are, are actually a problem? And so on, and so on, and so on. So how can you do that? So first of all, you can actually do merger simulation again. Okay, the, the problem, we'll talk about that in a second, the problem is identifying the effect of the merger. If I just compare the price at this point in time to the price in this point in time, a lot of things may have happened in addition to the merger. So how do I know, how can I separate out the component of the price change that is attributable to the merger from all these other things that might have happened? Maybe demand has shifted. So one way to do that is, you know, even though the merger happened, we can sort of artificially come back to this point do the merger simulation where really we only allow the firms to merge and keep everything else constant, that could be one way of identifying the answer. Okay, so that's some, one thing that we can do, but we talked about that already. Another thing that you can possibly do is to exploit the uh, natural experiments. Uh, again, the main issue is that mergers are not exogenous. <laughs> okay, if you can randomly assign mergers, then it will be fairly easy to identify the treatment effect of mergers, but you can't. And so one way to go about this is to try to look for a natural experiment that somehow affects market power and concentration in a way that has some exogenous components in it. And so we'll talk about one example very briefly. Then when you do that, maybe, uh, maybe you are more confident about identification, but issues with external validity arise. Okay, maybe this is a very special case, and so on and so on. So none of these things is really going to be perfect. Uh, and then additionally, we also see another brand of papers, which is this large-scale econometric analysis of many mergers. So think about the sample being all firms in the United States, and some of them were a target of a merger, and some of them were not. You know, what is the treatment effect of that? How can we find instruments for that? That's really tough. Okay. But these are the different ways in which people have attacked this uh, complicated problem. Right, so we can sort of try to fit this into a treatment effect type uh, uh, framework as some of these papers uh, uh, do. Uh, so you think about a large sample of firms uh, indexed by I, observed over T uh, time periods, indexed by small t. Um, some of these firms were acquired by another firm on or before a certain point in time, and some have not. So the treatment at any point in time is this indicator for whether or not you have been acquired by another firm. On the left-hand side, we have price, and this gamma is the parameter of interest. This is sort of, you know, the effect of the merger. And, you know, there are so many issues that come to mind when you start thinking about it in this way. Here there is a single gamma for everyone. This is a homogeneous treatment effect framework, but you could also possibly interpret you know, with, with uh, certain instruments, you can interpret it as a local average treatment effect and all these things that, that come into mind, this will become important because markets are so different than each other. I think that this is the main thing that is, is, is uh, so pervasive in I.O. is the notion that markets and firms are so different than one another and the institutional features are so <coughs> important that to really capture the effect of mergers with this gamma that sort of holds for everyone, or even to identify it as like an average of many, many things, you know, there is a question of, you know, how much do you, do you learn from that? You might not be that satisfied at the end, but still, okay, this is one way of getting at it. 
Right, now, obviously the issue is that the mergers are not randomly assigned. So one thing that helps is that, you know, we observe the firm over time, we can control for this time invariant unobserved heterogeneity using this fixed effect. But the fixed effect estimation still requires us to assume strict exogeneity of the merger. So this indicator at time t would have to be sort of uncorrelated with the errors at all time periods. And that would be very difficult to satisfy. So sometimes people run this regression, but then they end up apologizing for half the paper. Okay? <laughs> but sometimes that's what you do. Okay? And I, I, I'm actually not going to argue against these things. I would, my, my final slide will be to say that we should be doing all these things, okay? because we have so much to, to learn about these things. Okay? Um, again, just to be clear, the issue is that there could be shocks shocks to demand, shocks to regulation, shocks to a bunch of things that would be correlated with mergers. Okay, that's, that's the concern. All right, so one way to induce some exogenous variation here is to look at some natural experiment. Maybe something happened that can be somehow viewed as an exogenous variation in, in merger or in concentration or, or something like that. And so one a, a very nice example is the paper by Hastings, AR 2004. And so this is a paper that really takes this event study approach, there is a before and there is an, an after and there is a research design that suggests that there might be some way of making this before after comparison in a way that is relatively clean and identify what happens to prices following a merger. Actually this paper doesn't sort of supernaturally fit into what we're talking about here because this is a vertical merger and we are about horizontal mergers at least in today's uh, conversation. Um, but nonetheless Okay, so the issue is that there was a large vertical merger in the California gasoline market. This is a vertical market where you have upstream, you know, you have the refineries. And downstream you have, uh, you have gas uh, stations. Some of them are branded, they are owned by a refinery and some of them are independent. They all buy fuel from the refinery, but some of them are, are actually owned by the refinery and some of them are independent. And the merger involved uh, the sale of this large independent uh, uh, chain, uh, Thrifty, to one of the refineries, uh, which increased the share of sort of non-independent stations in the market. And so it's, you know, it's not a vertical, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a horizontal question, but you can think about some of this as a horizontal question. Um, you, you know, HHI also goes up in many local markets in, in response to this merger because we have basically, um, you know, one of these, uh, you know, one, one of these independent chains disappearing. The sort of fundamental idea here is that this is a large scale merger uh, that happens because, uh, you know, the owner decided to sell the, this chain but it sort of simultaneously affects concentration in many, many local markets. Competition in gasoline in retail gasoline is very local. And so here you can make the argument that uh, in some particular local market, which is really just a very small area in California, you know, the merger was kind of, you know, orthogonal to whatever demand shocks happened in that particular local market. So you have this merger differentially affecting many local markets in different ways, uh, but without necessarily being correlated with the shocks in any of them. This is a very rough intuition and the paper is much more serious in sort of convincing that this is reasonable and bringing a lot of institutional detail, okay? So don't, uh, don't take this as a sort of a, you know, a fully uh, complete and authoritative um, uh, defense for the identification uh, technique. But this is kind of what's going on. You want market structure to shift in a manner that is kind of orthogonal to the shocks in that local market. That's what you want. Um, and so this is one research design that you can look at and it turns out that the merger sort of on average have increased prices by about 5%. So this is one example of one thing that you can do, okay? Then of course, once you restrict attention to these cases where you have this claim that something happened, I think that the owner of this chain retired and it kind of put in motion all these things, uh, then of course you kind of limit the scope maybe of what you can look at because now, now you're only looking for these situations where that happens, all right? So maybe you get identification, but, uh, but uh, you know, what is the external uh, validity and so on. So one way to move forward is to do some meta-analysis to say, let's look at many, many papers that did this 
uh, although many of them didn't actually have natural experiment, whatever. Let's look at many papers that evaluated the effect of mergers and do a survey and see what happened in, across these papers. And actually, this is another nice benefit of the Aschenfelter, Hoskin, and Weinberg. So after they tell the history of regulation, etc., they say, well, let's take a look at what authors have found about the effects of mergers. But they suggest an interesting thought experiment. Okay, they say, let us examine 49 papers that estimated the price effects of horizontal mergers in 21 industries. In fact, most of these mergers are in four industries, airlines, banking, hospitals, petroleum. Most of the papers are about those things, um, which, is, um, which is kind of good and bad for the thought experiment here. But the thought experiment is this. We should focus attention not on the universe of mergers that take place. 95% of mergers that take place in a given year are not even being examined, do not raise any concerns. We should look at mergers that can be sort of reasonably said to have been on the enforcement margin. Mergers where, you know, we were not sure whether to approve them or not, but somehow they went over and they, and they were approved. That's what. Okay, so that's the problem. Ideally, the thought experiment they would like to, to do is to take the huge set of mergers that happened and isolate only those mergers where that ex ante were tough cases, were marginal cases where the decision could go either way. How do they do that? I mean, of course, it's very hard to do. So what they do is they, you know, they delve into these papers and they bring evidence from the institutional setting that suggests that this was a tough case. You know, there is no sort of perfect way of doing it. Then the thought experiment is, imagine that we average sort of the price effects of these mergers. If we find that on average prices went up, maybe it means that the policy is too lax, that more of these mergers should have been blocked. Whereas if on average prices go down, then maybe it means that the policy is too tough, that actually, you know, as you, as you shift that needle and you decide, you know, where the threshold should be for enforcement, you know, maybe you didn't stop at the right place in terms of some first order condition. This is the thought experiment. It's not quite what they do Same. because, sorry. So the question is, well, you know, not only prices adjust, but also quantities, et cetera. Are, is there average across all firms in the industry or just the emerging firms? Uh, the, uh, the merging firms. Well, actually, it might depend. No, it might actually be the, the industry. Well, again, the issue is that, okay, let me, let me sort of respond to that as well by saying that that's not what they end up doing because they realize all these issues. And in, in particular, they realize that these 49 papers involve a lot of heterogeneity in what was measured, in the methodology that was applied. And in fact, even, you know, within those Papers, there are four papers about the same merger, the 86 Northwest Republic Airlines merger, and the estimated effects were plus 9.5%, plus 5.6, negative 1.8, and plus 7.2. So these papers differ quite a bit in methodology and in terms of what was measured, et cetera, and so on and so on. No, because they don't, they don't even compute, there is no regression in the paper at the end, what they do. And I actually, I actually think that this is quite nice. They just they give you the list and they tell you this is what we see in those papers, sort of one by one. And, the, and, and their only point is to say, in 36 out of, the, out of the 49 papers, we find price increases. So there is some very weak evidence here, maybe in favor of the claim. Which, which I think is precisely why, you know, they didn't want to aggregate over such things, right? I mean, they're not comparable. The bottom, yes. Can I ask, the, this is a bit of a strange, uh, you know, discontinuity analysis because what if all of those mergers that were close, you could go either way and weren't approved, did anyone, of course, these are the missing papers. So I'm assuming nobody publishes a paper on estimating the price effect on a merger that didn't, wasn't approved. Oh, you would, you would, you would, you would be surprised. Actually, okay. pe so people do the that. thought experiment is let's compare these with those marginal ones who weren't approved. Right? Because what if in every, in every, on average prices increase, right? that's the counterfactual. I agree. So this brings us back to simulation. And actually, some, sometimes we do see in papers... No, not 
of a merger that never that didn't happen. So yes, but then that, without with <laughs> yes, but okay, if it didn't happen, so at least maybe I'm missing something. But unless I simulate what would have happened, how do I know? No, so I thought you, I thought they they looked at papers that looked at before and after a merger and yes. the prices, and that's the effect of the merger. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. I see, so I see, I see. On fifty cases where they weren't approved, you could do the same. Maybe exactly. You find zero, but okay, you so find zero. that strategy is part of the next paper I'll talk about, where you, com where you try to construct some control groups. Yeah. Basically, my point here is to give a very brief tour of some of these papers and to try to show, you know, just how tough the, the challenge is without sort of necessarily sort of supporting, you know, the methodology of any of them over another one. The point is that, you know, it's a, it's a tough problem, but exactly what you suggest has been done and, and we'll see that in a couple of minutes. Um, all right, so, I mean, this is in some sense the most agnostic thing that you can say. I mean, here, here you just say, I don't want to do econometrics here, I don't want to average over apples and oranges, these things are so different, then I'm just going to tell you what happened. And I think that that's also, I, I have to say, I think it's a nice way of adding to the literature. Okay, just, let's just look at it and see what people have found. But then there is an alternative approach, which Ori sort of have built towards. And, okay, this paper has received a lot of attention. Here you consider all mergers in U.S. manufacturing sectors. But in fact, you consider all plants. Also plants that were not target for merger. And you try to use those as some sort of controls. And it's very difficult to come up with reasonable control groups, but they do it in different ways. And they seem to be finding a consistent answer throughout all these imperfect different strategies, which is sort of the uh, nice thing about this paper, okay? Okay, so this is also related a little bit to something else that Ariel talked about, and he said when we're not going to have too much of that in this conference, estimating production functions, estimating productivity. Okay, so here is what these authors did. All right, we'll, we'll at least get a start on this and continue tomorrow. So they use plant-level data from the census on the typical things you can gather from the sort of, uh, you know, industry census. Uh, inputs, outputs, revenue, that type of stuff, okay. Then you estimate the production function and you back up, you back out productivity measures uh, and you also back out the markups implied by this. This specifically follows the methodology by the Locker and uh, Vazinski in AR 2012, but this really builds on the Oli Pekis and some additional uh, work that came after that. Basically, the idea is that, you know, fundamentally, if you could just regress outputs on inputs, then you learn, and the residual is productivity, then you somehow can back it out. And then, of course, it's so difficult to do because of endogeneity. And so these papers have uh, suggested ways of, of uh, dealing uh, with that. And then also, by making uh, the relatively weak assumption as they say, of cost minimization, you can also back out a markup measure for each of these plants. And I will not have the scope, you know, within the time frame that I have to go into how you do that. I think this is a very nice literature in general, very nice metho methodology. But the point is that after I do this, now I have markup and productivity measures for plants over time. I can use those as dependent variables. I can regress those on, you know, the whether or not you were acquired by another firm. So the outcome is how productive you are and what markup do you charge, and the treatment is whether or not you were acquired. And sort of, you know, we will see the sort of big deal that came out of this paper is that they found that, uh, you know, productivity doesn't go up, but markups go up. Okay, so the way that the media picked up on this paper is to say, well, in that trade-off, we have a clear winner. You know, the, the triangle beats the, 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 the rectangle, okay? So, something like that. The rectangle is not there, and the triangle is, is big, right? So, and that's how this paper is cited in some blogs, etc. But, it, you know, it's worthwhile to take a close look. The paper is, uh, is, is, is you know, I think uh, very clear on limitations, etc. tries to deal with them in, in very reasonable fashions, but still it will be interesting to look at what's actually being done and then to sort of, you know, reconsider the final conclusion, all right? In terms of identification, okay, so we have fixed effects for plant and also for segment year to capture all sorts of trends that might be going on, that's fine. Uh, but then again, you know, there might be time varying things that are correlated with mergers, so fixed effects are not going to do the trick. And so they also construct control groups 
in all sorts of, of uh, different ways. Um, all right, I guess we can look at some of this. So this is baseline results. This is when they just have fixed effects, no control groups. And so, you know, we're not sure that this is clean. We're not sure that anything is clean. No, so right now there is no notion of, co of con okay, right now we are just comparing plants that were acquired to plants that were not acquired. All the plants that were not acquired in some sense are control groups. We have fixed effects for the plant and maybe for some other things, and that's all that we do, okay? And so this is our first opportunity to see this sort of big result of the paper. Productivity goes up in an insignificant fashion. Markup goes up by a significant fashion. Yes. It would be, you know, it takes time and they're doing this. All right. So, absolutely. So, actually, in the last slide, I will talk about some of the caveats that they discuss with respect to their results, and that'll be one of them, okay. and also some, some, some of my own. But absolutely, you know, we're not getting everything, but this is like the big picture. All right. But then they say, okay, but maybe these fixed effects, maybe they don't deal with everything, right? So, maybe we want, rather than regress this on all plants, maybe we should just take plants that were a target for uh, an acquisition, but we match each of them with the closest neighbor. This is, you know, using propensity score matching. We find another plant that was not acquired that is as similar to them as possible. And, you know, definitely in terms of the time that I have here, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about propensity score matching. It's not, the issue is that you're, you're not matching on sort of the unobserved things that, that you worry about. So this is not necessarily uh, very convincing. So when they do this, Okay, they, they actually have a negative effect for productivity. Okay, this is even worse. An insignificant effect for the markup, but then they take the three nearest neighbors. Okay, they got one neighbor, it wasn't good enough. They take another two in the control group, and then, you know, but it's transparent, right? I mean, we see everything. And now, now we get the markup, uh, the markup uh, back where it was, and we still see that productivity is even hurt by the merger. All right, all right. So, so these are the things that come up from that methodology okay, in the AL paper. And these are other sort of more traditional ways of measuring, um, measuring productivity. Sorry, I didn't mention that. But indeed, I think that Ariel talked. Yes. Is, uh, is this also a Ali's comment? I, it doesn't weight by quantity. So it could be that all the quantity went to the more efficient. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on. Right. Oh, so, okay, okay, so on that, they will have some claim. They, at, at the end, they say, okay, here I show you results that are at the firm level rather than at the plant level, and this reallocation should be captured there and doesn't change so much. So that, yeah, so that is their attempt to, to respond to that. Um, yeah, but I, think, I mean, there's more cool stuff, and I actually don't want to rush. So why don't we, uh, I think I'm done, right? So <laughs> why don't we just pick this up tomorrow? I'll keep you with some suspense, although I already told you what happens. <laughs>